the float float baller. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That's Flø- another flute baller. Flute baller. <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's a that's a mean one. <laughs> Meet Palebo, a digital nomad from Denmark on an epic journey around the world. My name is Palebo, and I'm a longtime radio producer. In 2013, I started planning to become a digital nomad and a full-time traveler. Three years later, I had sold my house, my car and all my furniture. And in July 2016, I set out on a quest to visit every country in the world. In this podcast, I'm taking you along on my journey. And I'm sharing my ups and downs and let you listen in to conversations with some interesting people I meet along the way. This is the Radio Vagabond Podcast. Very famous Danish baker uh, with Danish ancestors that makes Danish. Oh, uh, uh, they make the Kringle. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Or as we call it, Kringle. Uh, so Racine is known for its Kringle. Yeah, known for the biggest Danish community, I think. I was just Still? googling. Uh, yeah, and, and in fact, a bit further north, there's a small town called Denmark. So I thought I was going up there, but then I, I saw oh, a Danish baker, and uh, and then I. It turned out that it's it's a very big Danish community, so... Like with people from Denmark? Yeah, or ancestors. Ancestors, because, yeah, yeah I don't think people come here from Denmark so much anymore. No. I'm driving north of uh, Chicago right now. I'm taking the exit right here. I'm on my way to Racine, uh, and there should be a Danish community here, uh, with or a community of Americans with a Danish ancestors and being a Dane uh, I find that quite interesting I saw that there's a bakery uh, that is very successful and uh, I'm going to meet the owner and talk to him about his his uh, his his history his bakery and uh, then try to taste his uh, his Danish um, yeah uh, bread and 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 pastry and his very famous kringle as they call it in Danish we call it kringle uh, and uh, I'm 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 quite excited to see if if it's uh, anything like I know from from back uh, home in Denmark and I am almost here before I enter the Danish bakery here in Racine, let me mention that this episode is brought to you in part by Hotels25.com. It's a website that searches a bunch of the big hotel search sites in one simple search. Hotel search sites, that was, <laughs> that was a tongue twister. Hotels25.com, you should try it, it actually works. Also, if you could please give this podcast a five-star review in Apple Podcast or your podcast app, I would be so happy. It helps other people find this podcast. Anyway, as I've been talking, I've crossed the big parking lot and now I'm entering the shop. I see a sign where it says, Happy Hygge. Hygge is a word that the Danes are famous for. According to the Oxford definition, hygge is a quality of coziness that engenders a feeling of contentment or well-being, regarded as a defying characteristics of the Danish culture." End quote. So I see the sign and greet the woman behind the counter with these words. Happy hygge. Okay. <laughs> but she's Italian and doesn't really understand what it means. Italian, I don't even know what it means. <laughs> what? I said I'm Italian, I don't know what that means. <laughs> you don't know? <laughs> something, it's something positive, I know that. It is very yes. positive, yeah. <laughs> Can I help you? Uh, I'm here to see Eric. Here to see Eric? Yeah. What is your name? Pella. <laughs> yeah. Pella. P-A-L-L-E. Pella. Oh, Pella. Like Bella with a P. Sort of. Hi, Eric. Good to see you. Eric takes me into the conference room with windows overlooking the bakery itself and offers me something to drink. A cup of coffee would be nice. Sure. Um, Just black. Just black? Yeah. Wonderful. 
family sit up here and yeah. If this is okay with you? This is uh, this is so okay. It, 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 it feels like coming home. Oh, uh, <laughs> well, that's very nice. Yeah. A compliment. Yeah, yeah. And uh, especially the bread looks just like uh, it, it does back home. Is that yeah. right? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's really cool. So, so Eric, uh, you're you're the owner uh, of yes. uh, yeah, I'm O&H. Yeah, third generation owner. Third generation. Yes. Uh, so, uh, so, so you're... That must be your grandfather yes. who came from Denmark? He did. Yeah. Yep. In fact, we have a little storyline right on the, on the yeah, wall. Yeah, it was so, amazing, yeah. So my, my grandfather and his father, of course, um, were from northwest Denmark. From, from Jaring? Yep. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. That's uh, where we go when we go to the beach. Ah, yes. Yeah, looking. Uh, yeah. Beautiful beaches up that way, right? Very, very. The best beaches in Denmark, yeah. Mm-hmm. So you, you, you're great. You know, your grandfather came here when and why? Uh, actually, my great-grandfather came here. Uh, he was uh, working on a communal farm up in uh, that area of Denmark, mm-hmm. and he was also uh, a postal carrier. Mm-hmm. And uh, he, um, his wife, uh, my great-grandmother, uh, passed away shortly after their last child was born. Mm-hmm. And uh, so he came to the United States looking for a better life for his family. When, when was that? Uh, that was in the early 1900s. Oh. Uh, so I want to say it's, um, I don't have the precise date for you, but somewhere between 1910 and 1920. Around First World War, just before? Just before, yeah. yes. And uh, he uh, got jobs here uh, working on a farm. So he wasn't uh, a baker? He was not a baker. Then, huh? uh, he slept in the barn. Uh, he made thirty dollars a month, and he sent twenty-eight dollars back to uh, Denmark oh. every month. Yeah, and uh, eventually uh, he saved up enough money to uh, give out of, his out of the t- out of the two dollars he had yeah. left. <laughs> yeah, uh, but no, eventually he uh, he was able to send enough money that the children could come over. Oh. Not all at once, oh. but they came over. So all oh. of his children did make it to the United States. Um, my grandfather included with them. And um, and there were a total of uh, of uh, four no five children, mm-hmm. um, four of which stayed in the United States, and one liked Denmark more, so went back to Denmark. Yeah. Uh, the uh, but they did all spend a fair amount of time here, so they started in Racine, all of them. And uh, my grandfather is the the only one out of that bunch that stayed in Racine. Yeah. And uh, he. But, but, uh, tell me a little bit about Racine because it's a, it, there's a, a lot of Danish uh, uh, Danish American community here. That's right. Uh, yeah. So I think that uh, the story about my great grandfather is is pretty similar to probably a lot of stories uh, in that in the sense that uh, opportunity was available in the United States and uh, Racine was a place to go where a lot of other Danes have already come mm. and. Uh, and not only just uh, Danes looking for a better place, but Danes that have come here and and were successful here. So you have the Danish uh, uh, equipment manufacturers, or uh, for instance, uh, here in Racine, um, we have uh, J.I. Case uh, is a uh, farm equipment company. Mm-hmm. Um, and there were wagon companies back then. Uh, there were um, um, small... Um, Oh, manufacturers of all sorts of different things, many of which were affected or owned uh, by uh, Danes. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they were looking for workers too. So I think there was an active uh, effort to try and get more workers from Denmark uh, to come over. And, um, and they were successful in doing that. So uh, Racine was a place where uh, I think Danish immigrants, especially back then, felt comfortable coming, not mm-hmm. only because there were other Danes here, but uh, you know, we're right next to Lake Michigan, which is a large body of cold water, uh, <laughs> which Danes are familiar with how that is. We don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> Neither do we sometimes. We're just familiar with it. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we are Racine County. Uh, this area of Wisconsin is a rolling meadows. Uh, again, very familiar to, uh, to most Danes. So I think the, the feel of being in Racine was... Uh, although not identical, was close to the feel of being in Denmark. You're listening to the Radio Vagabond podcast. 
Before we continue, I'd like to remind you that I would be so thrilled if you shared it on Facebook or Twitter. It's funny to see what's perceived as Danish culture gets watered down over time. I saw that some years ago in a Danish village, Solvang in California, and also here in Racine. That can be very true, and it's true in many cases, especially in the United States, where you know we are truly a melting pot of, uh, of a lot of different cultures that have come together. And, um, and the Danish culture is, is very similar to so many of the others. So it gets a little watered down, I think, yeah, yeah, over yeah. time. Um, for instance, my grandfather never went back to Denmark. He came here and, um, and he didn't have a desire to go back to Denmark. Um, for that matter, he didn't really have a desire to leave Racine. So he, he didn't travel much. And, um, but we had in Racine, we had the Danish social clubs and, and, um, and he found a career in baking through working in other bakeries in Racine. And, and, um, and then he took a risk and started his own bakery with a partner. And, uh, what, what, what was he, what, did he have any background in, 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 in baking? When he came to Racine, no, he was he was really uh, just a, a teenager, um, mm-hmm. and uh, so I think he was about 16 or 18 years old, more like 18, I think, and um, and he also got a job in a, on a farm when he first arrived in Racine. But then after uh, after a harvest uh, was over, he got a job in a bakery, and and so it was really just work that he was looking for. Yeah. He must have been very good at it. Yeah, and yeah. Uh, so for the next 25 years or so, he worked in, in more than just a couple uh, Danish bakeries in Racine. And, um, and then uh, he uh, had an opportunity to open up his own bakery with, with a partner. So my grandfather's name was Christian Olsen, and, uh, and his partner's name in this business was uh, Harvey Holtz. So it's Olsen and Holtz, or O&H okay. Bakery, okay. is how that was formed. And my, uh, my but, but my grandfather, you know, Racine is kind of a, a community of split into two geographic regions. We have mm-hmm. the north side of Racine and mm-hmm. the south side of Racine. Mm-hmm. And the Danes were very, very concentrated in the south side of Racine. Okay. Oh, yes. And O&H Bakery was opened in the north side of Racine. Oh. So it was blasphemy oh. that uh, how could a Dane, or how could a Danish oh. bakery even be in an area of town that's there's not like a whole bunch of Danes yeah. living in that area. So, so he was uh, ridiculed by some. Uh, was that just some. because he was able to get the uh, a property there for a bakery, or I think it's just people trash talking myself. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So, uh, he he opened up a bakery, and uh, my father was 16 at the time. So and. My father had various ways of making money, like he had a couple paper routes and, and worked in some other places. And Well, then he started helping my grandfather out and uh, uh, after school, of course. And, and when his high school was over and my dad was uh, looking to go on to college, uh, my grandfather and he had a, had a father-son talk and my dad decided to try baking for a, a year before he went on to college. And uh, my dad. Oh, let me do yeah, that yeah, for a year. I'll try it. Yeah. So, my dad was an exceptional baker and businessman, yeah, yeah. and uh, and kind of you might say the rest is history. Yeah. So, so he really took what your grandfather did and and developed it. Uh, he did. Uh, my dad. Uh, he loved people, mm-hmm. and uh, and so much a big part of baking is people. Because you know we we are people that craft something every day, and we display it for our customers, mm-hmm. and we get to explain how we make it, and mm-hmm. we get to share the enthusiasm that yeah. the customers yeah. have when yeah. they buy it. And my dad embraced all of that; yeah. he loved it. So, it, w- was it always in the cart that you should t- take over? Uh, you know, it kind of se- might seem that way, but my parents really didn't uh, uh, present it that way. Yeah. They just uh, my parents wanted to have a successful business that provided for their family yeah. and they wanted to be uh, doing something that they were passionate about and, and have it show up in, in what they do. So that's exactly the way they were. They loved the people that they worked with, they loved the customers, they loved the community and it showed in many ways. Mm-hmm. And, um, and they had three boys, uh, I'm the youngest of those three boys and, and because they were also teaching boys 
the values of life and and work ethic. Yeah. Of course, we were expected to work, and and why not work in the business? And you're going to be managed by your your father, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, so that's exactly how we we uh, we learned how to work, and we learned how to get along with one another and yeah. many other people that yeah. way, and. So, and it was beyond just working in the business because all of the time and attention that my parents had was poured into their family and their work. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, we learned a lot from them. And beside us is also Matt. Matt, are you fourth generation or? Sort of. I'm, uh, I'm the son-in-law. I'm here. I married uh, Eric's daughter. Um, and so, I fortunately have been able to work here as well yeah. and help extend some of the, the family legacy and values into you know, the fourth generation and my daughters are the fifth generation. So, um, oh, yeah. wow. so we'll see, I think we want to continue with the same approach that you know, Eric's parents and Eric has um, and, and Lisa have really demonstrated for us, which is just giving us a great business to operate in and whether the, the family wants to be part of it, it's, it's really their opportunity yeah. to be part of it if they decide to do that. Yeah. They also do rye bread, yes, which is something that's very popular in Denmark. We eat it in thin slices for open-faced sandwiches, or as we call it, smørbrød. And you can get it in some shops around the U.S. It looks right, but it's rare that you get something that's exactly like we remember it from back home. As I mentioned earlier in our conversation, the culture gets kind of watered down. Uh, the And sometimes the products get kind of, you might say, uh, uh, just changed a little bit yeah. to to adapt to people's taste. Yeah. So this rye bread we make, uh, uh, we call it rubro, uh, and uh, yeah, totally. we, uh, I know, rubro. <laughs> 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 Thank you. I have a hard time even saying it. So that is the bread that they really miss. And of course, you have the the very famous Kringle. That's, yeah. that's your the, the, the thing. Signature yeah. Item. yeah, the signature. Yeah. Signature item. The one that. People love the most. Yeah. Uh, that particular uh, pastry is uh, it's a series of layers of butter. We also yeah. add margarine to the butter, so it's a it's a blend of the two, um, and uh, and just folding it and, and getting a light, tender, flaky pastry, yeah. 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 and uh, and making the kringle out of that that dough is is what's really popular. Yeah. We make other rolls and, and yeah. various things out of that dough as well, coffee cakes, but the kringle is really popular. It is, it is so funny. Every everywhere in the world, they call this type of uh, pastry Danish, and in Denmark we call it Vienna bread, which right. means bread from Vienna. Yes, it's a wonderful story to tell. Yeah. It's a piece of history. If I get it here, do you think I, as a Dane, would feel that it tastes the same as it does in Denmark, or does that get watered down as well? Well, you know, that's a matter of opinion because exactly. we're we're talking about food, and uh, for every single person food is a personal experience and our experiences shape our opinions mm. so um, my opinion for instance when I travel to Denmark because wherever I travel and by the way I'm a fun person to travel with because my wife and I we always find bakeries so <laughs> we go into a lot of bakeries and we like eating good bakery mm. uh, so we are we're always on a quest to of find course. good bakery. And, and I did the same thing in Denmark. And uh, I found that the Copenhagen was pretty similar, the bakeries in Copenhagen were pretty similar to what we make here. Um, but the further I got away from Copenhagen into rural Denmark, mm. then it changed a bit too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, true, true. Yeah. And, and so I'm guessing the same occurs for the for Danes exactly. that yeah. do the same as me, finding bakeries all over and, yeah. and comparing the differences yeah. between the two. So. So that's why what I mean by it's a matter of opinion. If you were from northern Denmark and come here, you would probably say, this is nothing like what we have in Denmark. No. If you're from Copenhagen, you'd probably say, yeah, this is, no, we have some people that say, this is better than what I get in Denmark. Well, I'm not <laughs> going to say that it's better. I'm going to say, I, we're really happy that you appreciate what yeah. we're making. Yeah. This is the Radio Vagabond podcast. We continue our tour around the bakery and enter a big office. Yes, we have, this is our call center yeah. because uh, we do so much mail order yeah. and it's very seasonal. So yeah. during the Christmas season is when we're the busiest and we'll fill this call center with people taking calls from all over the country and oh, uh, people placing. The, uh, not just the state, but all over the country. All over the country. 
yeah. So uh, you send Kringle all over? We do, and uh, and other items as well. Yeah. And uh, there's a lot of uh, a lot of different products that we make, but uh, but certainly, yeah, the Kringle is the most popular. People love to share it, and uh, that's what makes it special. To, to me, this is like a big facility compared to most it Danish is. bakeries. It it's a production hall. How many people work here when it's full? Yeah, about 80 people work wow. here. Yes. When I was little, it was one oven, one workbench, yeah. and you know a couple mixers, and and people crafting bakery. Now we have nine ovens. We have more than one. We have multiple workbenches, and we have multiple mixers, and it's people crafting bakery. Yeah. So to me, it's machines are not replacing. No. Mach machines are helping us to make more bakery even better quality. And I guess there's a lot of people working here in the middle of the night as well to yes. get the bread ready for the morning. That's right. Yeah, the bakers uh, typically start about 9 p.m. and um, uh, some a little bit earlier, but uh, the ovens are going by nine. Uh, you know, there's a, a lot of uh, a lot of Kringle being baked, a lot of sweet rolls and, and various uh, pastries being made, uh, coffee cakes. We make a lot of donuts in the United States. People love their donuts, yeah, yeah. and um, even though that's not typically Danish, it but, isn't. but who cares? It isn't. Yeah. But you know, there's 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 a products like uh, like the Kroller. Um, it's it's got some origins in Denmark, mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. uh, you know the fried pieces of dough kind of thing. Um, but in the United States, they really love it. So uh, the donuts. So to not make donuts is not really a good business sense. No. When we were bakery, so we make donuts too, and um, again, we we uh, we make them as I think as good as anybody. The Kringles that they make here are oval and not shaped like a Kringle, because the Kringle in Danish means the shape of a pretzel, as the American calls it. But in the beginning, they were shaped like a Kringle. When Kringle was first made here in Rusain, like probably everywhere, it was an almond filled pastry um, and um, a granulated sugar topping um, in fact it was made in the shape of a pretzel uh, mm -hmm. very traditional uh, very good mm -hmm. uh, the bakers ever seen heard their customers saying this is really good but you know how it could be better you know and how is that well get rid of the parts that overlap that pretzel you have all these overlapping parts and that gets eaten last whenever mm -hmm. we share it mm. Mm -hmm. um, so people always go for the parts with the filling inside mm -hmm. and uh, and oh well what about making some different flavors and uh, so that's yeah. what the Rusin Bakers did yeah. Yeah. they changed the shape to an oval yeah. got rid of the overlapping parts yeah. and they started adding more f flavors yeah. like apple and prune and apricot and and uh, it's it's gone well beyond that to yeah. where we make every day we have 18 different flavors available for people to purchase in our yeah. store and then we enter the bakery itself but before that i was given a mouth cover face mask and a hairnet as if i really needed a hairnet and before we entered i had to step in a mat now step on this mat because it's filled with a sanitizing solution and everything is, of course, to make sure that everything is totally clean and sterile inside the bakery and no germs will get into the products here in any way. So we'll start over here and just walk through our cake department. And you can see our, our decorators are crafting all these uh, very pretty, wow. pretty cakes all here. Handmade. Yep. So. That pretty. We walk around for 20 minutes and it was super interesting to see how they made the Kringle and the many other kinds of pastry. And even though they do traditional Danish pastry, bread and cakes, they must of course think about what sells here in the US and of course cater to the American taste. And sometimes they try to do something that just doesn't sell here, like the traditional Danish flødebolle. The flødebolle? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's Flø another... Flødebolle? Flødebolle? <laughs> All right. <laughs> that's, a, that's a mean one. <laughs> you know, we've tried making that, too. And we make it very good, but again, customers just aren't looking for that. They're not... 
So I think we make it very good. But, yeah. you know, we know how to make it. We've done it. We've tried it. Maybe we'll try it again someday. Yeah, yeah. But, um, I saw a, a, a sign back there. There's a story about uh, uh, Dwight Eisenhower. Yes. Uh, what, what was well, that? yeah. The, um, Dwight Eisenhower, one of our past presidents from the 1950s. Um, it was actually his wife, uh, Mimi Eisenhower, I believe is her name. Um, she was introduced to Kringle. And um, so she um, uh, ended up sending Kringle his gifts through the mail to uh, some of her friends. Mm -hmm. And this was, so this was in the 1950s. And it wasn't, uh, uh, um, it was somehow the story of it got captured by one of the large uh, magazines that was mm -hmm. uh, uh, distributed nationwide. And, uh, and the word Kringle was first introduced oh. you know, nationwide in a, in a publication um, with Mimi Eisenhower's uh, you know, name attached to it. Yeah. It became very popular yeah, to, yeah. for people thus thinking. It, yeah, went, it, it went viral. Yes, it went viral <laughs> before viral was invented. Yes. Yeah. The, uh, But was the Kringle from, from around these parts? It was from Racine, yes. Yeah, yeah there was a bakery in Racine that... Uh, um, they ended up, of course, uh, doing a lot more mail order than they were prior to that story. Mm. And my father, to uh, his credit, he understood that the mail order, the shipping of the Kringle, that's a part of the business that he needs to embrace. He needs to be passionate about that, the same as he's passionate about yeah. the breads and, and serving to customers. Me that, to me, store. that's so weird to send Kringle in the mail. <laughs> I, I, I guess it's... A United States thing. It is, yeah. Uh, it's because... Uh, Denmark is so small, we just drive. Yeah, right. <laughs> well, there, there's probably a quite a bit of truth to that. Yeah. Uh, the, um, the shipping Kringle has grown kind of at the same pace or the same uh, uh, popularity as, as, um, as people being moved around in the United States. It's, you know, it's very common here in, in the United States where... You, um, uh, you may have been born in a certain area, but now you live uh, literally a 48 or a 24 hour drive away uh, from, from where you grew up. So it's not easy to go home. So what do people do? They send part of home to them. How big a percentage of your business is, uh, is on the mail? It's uh, about 50% of no, our business. No, you're kidding. No. no. Yeah. But very I, I, seasonal. I, I thought, okay, if you say 10, that's, uh, that's a lot. Yeah. But around 50%? Yes. Wow. Yeah. So it's, it's just that popular. And uh, it all goes back to my father embracing that mail order part, that this is not something we should just throw it in a box and ship it out and, you know, let's do it right, yeah. like anything else. I really like to thank Eric and the ONH Danish Bakery for taking the time to see me. And both the Hupol and the Kringle I got to taste was very good. That was almost it for this episode. In a few seconds, I'll reveal where I'm going after Chicago. But before that, let me remind you that I would be so thrilled if you would give me some stars in Apple Podcast or in your podcast app. And if you have a few minutes, please write a few lines in a review. It helps other people find this podcast. You can reach me on mail if you have any feedback or questions or tips for me on what to see and who to talk to when I get to a new destination. I promise that I'll answer any email I get on mail at theradiovagabond.com. You can follow me real time where I am right now on the official Facebook page, facebook.com slash Vagabond, and on Instagram and Twitter as Radio Vagabond. Find all these links at theradiovagabond.com where you can also see a lot of pictures. This episode was brought to you in part by Hotels25.com. It's a website that helps you find the best prices on hotels around the world. Hotels25.com, you should really try it. It really works. I'm about to leave Chicago and my next stop will be Nicaragua. And I'm so looking forward to that. My name is Palabo and I gotta keep moving. See ya.